Hey everyone, um, welcome to our FCCF virtual classroom. Um, this is going to be our fourth session on Flojo version 10.6.2. For anyone that this is their first time joining, uh, my name is Kathy Daniels. I'm the manager of the Flow Cytometry Core facility at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, and you'll see Rui Gardner, who's the head of the facility. Um, he's going to be moderating this session as he has for the previous session. So um, I'll reiterate this as we go along, but please feel free to ask questions in the chat function on our, um, that you'll see at the bottom of the, of the Zoom meeting. And uh, if anything seems unclear, if you want any clarification, any questions, please feel free to use that. Okay, so today what we're going to do is we're going to be going over instrument characterization and um, how to uh, utilize some instrument characterization um, analysis to help you out. We're gonna do that via Flojo version 10.6.2. And we're also going to be uh, looking at calculating uh, the spillover spread matrices. So uh, again, we're gonna briefly touch on some different characterization methods that might be uh, utilized. Uh, we're going to focus on the CD4 voltage walk after we have a very brief discussion on those and talk about how we can use that to characterize our instruments or certain instruments um, and, and use that data for a spillover spread matrix. Okay. Um, some other topics we'll go over again, stain index, concatenation, um, and, and what resolution means. Okay. So some important links that we uh, like to mention each time. Flojo has been um, pretty wonderful. And while many people are working from home, given the current um, scenario, uh, they have provided a free license um, available to anyone working from home. So that's the first link up top. Then we encourage everyone to visit our fccf.mskcc.org uh, website. That's our Flow Cytometry Core Facility website where we have a lot of educational material. We have um, announcements. We have pre-recording or recordings rather of all of these other sessions that we've done both for Flowjo and FCS Express um, in addition to other webinars that we posted. Okay, our Twitter uh, handle is flow at flow MSKCC. So we have multiple um, announcements that we'll give there. We do flow post its educational content, um, share news from other facilities. And just recently we uh, posted a parody song called I'll, I'll Sword Again. <laughs> um, so feel free to check that out. We're, we're pretty proud of that one. Um, ISAC is the International Society of the Advancement of Cytometry, and they've actually done a wonderful thing in providing Cyta University for free um, during this time as well. So feel free to visit those links. And if you want to play around with Flojo or um, any analysis software, please feel free to visit flowrepository.org if you don't have any FCS files uh, yourself to, uh, to be able to play around with those softwares. Okay. A couple more important links. We have the um, Cytometry Part A journal, which if you click on that hyperlink, um, you'll be able to go over there and look at some recent articles about cytometry. We have the MetroFlow Regional New York, New Jersey Cytometry Users Group meeting. Uh, we typically have uh, a vendor meeting in the spring and then a, a more educational meeting in the fall. So be on the lookout for that. Um, in previous sessions, we've done a uh, image to FCS file, which is kind of fun. So you can convert images to FCS files. Um, and David Gravano shows us how to do that in that YouTube uh, link. And then lastly, we have um, a survey that we've sent out to, um, to the community as a whole, where we're trying to gather information from people on how they do their instrument QC and characterization. There are multiple methods that are utilized and we wanna get uh, information from people on what they're doing, what's the most common approach, and maybe how we can improve that um, and standardize it across all. Okay, so we'll be sending out these slides. So even though you can't see what that link <laughs> is, um, we'll be sending these uh, slides out. The, um, the contacts are both Rui Gardner and myself. I had fixed the, the font on the last one. I apologize, I didn't fix it on this one. Um, my email is danielk1 um, at mskcc.org. So that's not an L, it's D-A-N-I-E-L-K-1 at mskcc.org. But don't fret, because I'm going to email this to everyone who registered or attended. So you'll be getting the email directly from me. Okay. Lastly, we want to say thank you to all the members of our Flow Cytometry Core facility have, who have been nothing short of amazing during 
um, before, during, and I'm sure it will be after um, this whole uh, scenario of having to work from home and being in New York City. So we want to say thank you to each and every one of you. Um, you know who you are and you're wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So what we're going to talk about today um, is obviously instrument characterization and how we can use some of that data uh, and analyze it utilizing Flojo. Okay. So what I'm sure you're aware of if you utilize flow cytometers is there are multiple articles that you're going to find um, on different methods for instrument QC and characterization, whether it's instrument specific, like it was the first one that I brought up with the cytoflex, determining background signal to noise, um, you know, what are these different parameters and what they're measured for and, and what you want to see from those values. Oftentimes you might hear Q and B and say, okay, what is that, right? <laughs> um, so they're all um, types of different terminology, different articles that you might see. And uh, we're gonna uh, dive into uh, one of those methods, but what's the reason that you wanna characterize? Why can't I just go in there and, and utilize the, the voltages or the, the gains that are put in um, automatically by, by my instrument? It's going to be a different answer um, at this point per instrument because there are certain um, methods that manufacturers might utilize. So this isn't um, an approach for every single cytometer. Today we're focusing on the BD cytometers um, that we have with, with voltages and gains, but with those instruments, uh, most people might use uh, CSNT, and, um, and we'll dive into why that might not be the best approach for, or is not the best approach for setting voltages. Okay, so like I said, there are some different approaches, CST being one of them, or cytometer setup and tracking um, beads, that's specific to DIVA. Okay, you have QuantiFlash, which is a nice tool um, to measure Q and B that's recently come out. Um, you have eight peak beads, the peak two method, and another, there are more, but the CD4 voltage walk is the one that we're going to be talking about today. Okay, so this is a method that we're going to utilize um, for, for our discussion today. That CD4 voltage walk up is, is very nicely summarized um, in the immunophenotyping methods and protocols. Um, by, by Springer Protocols, and specifically in chapter one by Florian Marr and Aaron Tisnik. Uh, they did a really wonderful job in, in summarizing why you would want to do this instrument characterization and detector optimization, um, how to actually do it, right? So the, the actual protocol for carrying out this instrument characterization, and then moving from there, how you can utilize that to do a spillover spread matrix to start getting an idea of the spreading of um, of certain fluorochromes in combination and how you can use that to better design your panels, okay? So this is um, a, a protocol um, and a chapter of that protocol book that I highly recommend if you wanna get a better understanding of why we're doing this. And even though I'll be talking about it a bit today, it'll go into a little bit more detail along with the, um, the protocol itself, which is, is, is nice and simple, okay? So essentially what we're going to do is we're going to analyze some data uh, where we start from the very low end, right? We're starting at the low end of um, about 200 volts or so at the lowest that we can possibly go. And we're going up in small increments, right? And recording FCS files of CD4 um, single stained um, PBMCs, okay? So essentially we have CD4 evaluation kits that are available from a variety of vendors. Um, and what we can do with that is we can single stain alloc plots of these PBMCs in, uh, for example, what we used was CD4 uh, anti-SK3. So they're all the same clone, it's all CD4, and they're all gonna have um, a decent level of expression of that CD4. And you'll do the single stain with different fluorochromes. What that enables you to do as you're doing the voltage walk up from the lowest possible at 200 and increase in increments of 30 up until the positive signals off scale, and you're gonna see this again, uh, it enables us to, to do a characterization of individual PMTs with biological material, which is a lot more uh, relevant to us than, than beads might be, okay? Specifically the CSNT beads that many people might think is the best starting point. Um, and what I wanna, 
iterate um, as, as I say that about CSNT is for anyone who has used CSNT or has used a DIA instrument, um, what winds up happening is you have a dim, a mid, and a bright peak, okay? When um, the cytometer setup and tracking software is trying to go ahead and decide the best voltages to use based on those beads, it's trying to get that dim peak uh, about 10, time, uh, 10 times the standard deviation of electronic noise. It's trying to set the signal of that dim peak of beads um, 10 times the standard deviation from that electronic noise and also optimize that bright peak, right? with target values. And what we know is we know from previous discussions in these sessions, we know from our education and flow cytometry in general, beads and cells are not the same. So we can't use those, um, those dim hard dyed beads as um, a replacement for cells in how we optimize voltages. Okay, so some helpful tips as you're going along to do this. If you don't have fresh PBMCs, you can util utilize lyophilized cells. So that's something that we used in our facility. We utilized um, a lyophilized cell product. There are many available from different vendors. They're from Beckman, you have them from BioLegend, you have them from BD, even though they might have discontinued those. Um, but there's cytotrols, there's varicells, there is lyophilized PBMCs from, from BD. So there are many available that you can use and they're nice and easy. We recommend titrating the CD4 antibody in advance of the characterization to make sure you're, um, you're utilizing them with the correct concentration. And be mindful if you, you, if you do a titration on one vial and one lot of one um, one specific fluorochrome that doesn't um, necessarily carry over to all the rest of your CD4s with different fluorochromes, I would recommend to titrate each file, okay? Uh, because you're likely going to be utilizing some in CD4s conjugated to dyes that are polymer-based, we recommend, um, and just in general, best practice, make sure you thoroughly wash your cells after staining to remove excess fluorochrome, all right? so. The three, uh, the three wash, uh, or the three washes after staining should be sufficient. And again, this is mostly uh, geared today towards PMT or photomultiplier tube-based instruments. And what we suggest is starting off of that lowest possible uh, voltage. And for the case of today, that would be 200. And then doing incremental increases of 30 volts at a time until we see that positive go off scale. Okay. Now that we're gonna come back to after, um, because what we're gonna do after, I can actually show you briefly, is we're going to be discussing the spillover spread and how that impacts, um, you know, after we do the characterization, look at the spillover spread and how we can use that to better design panels. Okay, so those are our introductory slides. Thank you guys for uh, being patient and listening to me over that. And again, I wanna remind you guys that if you have any um, specific, questions that you have as you go along really will absolutely um, interrupt me and ask those questions or be able to answer them himself. Okay, so I'm going to open up Flojo. Is there a question, Rui, or good? No, I'm okay. just saying I will, I will interrupt. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so for anyone um, who's joining us for the first session, if you haven't used Flojo in a while, what you'll see is there's a portal ID sign in. So it's uh, gone away from Shipley hardware base and now um, everyone needs a portal ID to log in, whether you're use, utilizing an individual account or a shared um, account. So be mindful of that. The portal ID is itself free. It's just whether or not you get a, um, a license for an individual or a shared account. Okay, so once I go ahead and sign in, what you'll see is it goes from unlicensed to a licensed version of Flojo where I'm able to utilize it to, to analyze some of my data. Okay, so in the flow cytometry core facility at MSK, what we did is we did um, this exact CD4 walk-up that I mentioned um, during the, the overview of the slides. And I'm gonna take um, some of those data files in and I'm gonna show you how we're gonna analyze that, how we're going to calculate what we want to use as the best optimized PMT voltage um, or OPV and what we're going to do, um, how we're going to look at that. Okay, so we have our training session from today. And I'm going to open up. And what I mentioned um, during previous sessions is if I go ahead and I just drag in a folder to all samples, it's going to bring in all of the FCS files from um, that folder. 
So what you'll see is there are quite a bit of FCS files here, um, 280 to be specific. But if I, um, if I kind of go deeper into this, you'll see all of those files are there and I didn't have to uh, go in and individually drag those in. There's also the option to going from, uh, from add samples right here. Okay. I'm not going to analyze 280 FCS files today. I don't think you guys would stick with me if I tried to analyze 280 FCS files today. So please don't run away because you see that. Um, but essentially what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to create a group and I'm going to start looking at one individual detector at a time. Okay? So the first detector I'm going to use is um, the detector that's off of the red laser uh, that we typically utilize for APC and we used APC for that. Okay, so I'm going to create a group and once I do that, what you'll notice is there's, there's no sample in there. I'm going to come back here and I'm going to sort by name by double clicking on this little name um, right there. Did it work? Oh, there we go. So if I double click on that, what happens is it starts to, to sort it out um, and it's typically alphabetically. So I'm gonna come in here and what you see is we actually started a little bit higher than 200. We started at 210 and I am just using the shift key and I'm dragging down to grab all of those APC files from that detector characterization, and I'm gonna drag it up to this group, okay? Uh, if you've joined previous sessions, you know I don't like when things are messy, so um, it automatically creates subgroups for folder names when you drag in a main folder, and I'm going to delete those just because I don't like it. Okay, so here in the APC, what you see, um, we named it um, to be very uh, clear with the name of the detector and also the, the starting voltage, okay? So I click on that right here, and I see my forward scatter and side scatter, okay? These lymphocytes are right here. You'll notice that uh, the number of cells that we acquired was actually um, pretty small because what we were trying to do, because we have so many instruments in our, faci in our facility, we were, we were really trying to get the biggest bang for a buck and trying to make sure that we had the, um, the best um, or we were able to use the samples across as many instruments as possible. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to uh, use this tool right here, the, the elliptical tool, and I'm going to drag that around my lymphocytes. Okay, and what I'm able to say, um, in once, like, once I create that gate, rather, is I see here that it just says lymphocytes. You don't need to leave that name. I can call that cells or scatter, and you can name it however you'd like. Okay. I'm gonna make that a little bit bigger and then I'm gonna take this scatter gate and I'm gonna drag it up to all of the APC. And I'm gonna double click on that gate and once I do that, it's only going to show me what was pre-gated here, okay? If I come to the side scatter area, what I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna come over here and change that parameter to be forward scatter height, okay? So when I do that, it's forward scatter height versus forward scatter area and I'm gonna utilize that as a doublet discriminator. Then I'm going to use the polygon tool, and each click is a node. And this is going to be a very basic review for most people, um, but just walking through some of the people that might, for some of the people that might be joining us for the first time. Okay. That single cell, uh, single cell gate, once I drag it up to scatter, it now becomes a daughter of that um, scatter gate. And for all of the uh, individual samples, it's going to go underneath. Okay. If I hit the shift key and then these two are on this, uh, these two plots are on that same starting file, which is APC 210 volts. If I click this little right arrow right here, what you'll see happens is both of these plots now change to that second file, that 240. And I'm going to use that very briefly just to make sure that all of my gating is correct. Okay. So we're toggling through, and I tend to go a little bit quick with that just to make sure that everything is okay. Okay. From there, I'm going to double click on the single cell gate. Now I can, I can delete these plots because I don't need them anymore. Now all I need to do is I need to look at my voltage walk up from 210 in increments of 30 up until the APC was off scale. So there are two different ways of doing this and I'm gonna show you the two different ways. First, I can um, come down here and on the x-axis I can choose APC. I like starting to uh, type it in in this little search window so it minimizes the options for me so I don't have to kind of go through all of those choices. Okay, so what I can do is I could either click on this um, y-axis and do histogram 
right? So if I do histogram right there, what's gonna happen that you see is that um, everything is kind of smushed together. So what I, uh, I mentioned in previous sessions, if you hit this uh, transform button and customize the axis, um, the width basis is what can be adjusted to adjust some of that negative space, okay? So as I bring that down, what I'm starting to see is that I'm able to resolve those two populations of the negative and positive, okay? So I wanna just adjust this a little bit so I can gate a bit better, okay? I'm gonna hit apply there. And this is the first method that I can use. I can just utilize that histogram or what I can do is I think that you're able to get a little bit of a better resolution by looking at it in a dot plot. Okay, so as opposed to looking at a histogram, if I click here, I can always do forward scatter or I can uh, do it versus another fluorescent parameter. And what you're seeing, if I make this a little bit better, is you're able to see that differentiation between positive and negative much better than you would be able to, to see it with um, a histogram. Because when I go to a histogram, because it's univariate, we're losing some resolution there, and it's just the positive and the negative. You wouldn't be able to really parse it out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to look at the uh, FC, uh, FSC, right, the scatter versus the APC, and I'm going to just um, use that to, to better pull out those populations. Sorry, I just turned around real quick. I want to make sure everything is good at home. <laughs> As like most people, I'm just working from home right now. Um, I use that little rectangular gate and I'm doing an APC negative, okay? So if I do APC negative right here and then I create another rectangular gate, what I can do is I can put it around the positive and I can call that APC positive, okay? Sometimes it gets a little bit buggy, so if you saw that that number was 151, as soon as I made a minor adjustment, it changed back to a percentage, okay? Hi, Kathy. Um, can, I, yeah. can I ask a question here? Mm -hmm. Somebody's asking what is the scale that's measured on the actual cytometer um, to make sure that all of these scale transformations will work? Uh, what's, the, what's the scale on if, the cytometer? In, yeah, if it's in log, linear. Yes, that's a good question. So typically all fluorescent data that we're looking at for this characterization is going to be in log. When you're setting up for cell cycle or anything that you would need to use on a linear range, you're typically doing um, a very quick um, we're not very quick, but when you're setting your voltages, you're doing it with a control set um, of whether it's a control cell line or some or chicken or blood cells, whatever it is, you're setting, uh, and we had a discussion on that on our previous session, you set the, um, the G1 peak in the linear range so it's at about um, uh, 50, right? Um, so if I had had that um, for a different application, I would be looking at it in linear but for the purposes of this instrument characterization, we're doing it in log, okay? Because that's most all applications for flow. Right, and, and uh, there's another question here that's also interesting. Um, can we do gates automatically because negative gate will shift with higher voltage? Um, so there, is, uh, there are some methods that might be available for automated um, gate shifting that you might have to do some uh, a little bit of programming for. So we're showing everything in a manual way today. That's not to say that there aren't automated um, methods for this. We're currently looking into some of those to make our lives a little bit easier. Um, but for right now, we're not gonna be going over that today, but it is a possibility. <laughs> so actually, there's a question here. If it's in log, you know, going back to your previous, the previous question, uh, how do you have values below zero? Does the cytometer store linear data as well? So does the cytometer, that, if you <laughs> so when, what winds up happening in cytometers, and Rui, um, please jump in at any point if you need to, um, you're gonna have um, like, you know, a, a spread, um, and you're going to have um, some photon counting error that, that occurs during, because of the, the Poisson distribution. So even though you see some values that are, um, that are slightly below zero, it's a distribution around zero at, that ver at those very, very low voltages. So um, that discussion is gonna, can go a little bit deeper as you start looking at compensation and everything like that. But what is going to happen is you're going to see a distribution and it's not just going to be one hard line at that low end. And when you're at that very low end, because we're looking at logarithmic scaling, 
um, the distribution of the negative might be a little bit more spread and there are, is going to be some fo photon counting error there where you'll see some below zero and, uh, and above uh, zero. Right, right, no, absolutely. Uh, the, the, the other thing I would add is that, so although it's, it's um, we're using log scale when we're acquiring, it's a digital instrument. So mm -hmm. all the data, the raw data is, is um, acquired in linear. Um, so it's it's linear data, and then it's there's a um, uh, you know the logarithm is is applied mathematically. So so that's why we still see the the negative values, right? Because in the old instruments, uh, we used to see um, only uh, data above zero because it had a um, an analog um, converter, uh, yeah. converter that was converting the data into into log. So yeah. so that's that's the reason why we end up seeing the negative. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Awesome questions, guys. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take those two populations, the negative and the positive, and I'm going to drag them up to that single cell gate under the APC. And what's going to happen is as I go through, as, as I go along, you see right here on the 210, I really wasn't able to resolve that population. When I go to the next, the 240, I'm able to resolve them a bit better. When I go to 270, you can see it's worlds better. Okay, so I'm going to just manually adjust these gates as we go along. And that was a great question earlier about um, automated gating that could potentially be um, a future project for us. Um, we're discussing it and um, be happy to share with people as we go along. Okay. So I'm just gonna keep dragging that over. Now you might wonder why am, why am I cutting out that middle population? What you'll see is because they're lyophilized PBMCs, you might have um, some monocytes that are going to stain for DIM positive for um, CD4. We can exclude that from our analysis. And that's another reason why I actually prefer to use the dot plots as opposed to the histograms. Because what's nice about the histograms when you're, when you're going along is there's this bisector tool which bifurcates the population. But if I do that, I have to kind of include those monocytes into the analysis, which I don't want to do. You could also go ahead and individually um, select two populations just with, um, just with the range gate, but I, I'd prefer if I was going to do a histogram and just keep on moving to use the bisector or the bifurcation gate, um, but it just, um, because of those monocytes, I'd prefer not to do it and also to make sure I get a better resolution there. So I'm going to continue to go along and I'm going to continue to modify the gates. And what you should see as you're going along is that this um, positive population should be very similar. You shouldn't see any changes. This is the same exact sample as you're going up. That is just, it's just the voltage that's being changed here. Um, and for anyone that's uh, joined in on previous sessions, I can show you uh, a method that we can utilize to QC to make sure I really know that those voltages are what I think they are. And I'll um, make sure I show everyone else that who might not have been in previous sessions. Okay. So going along, go. Like I said, I'm definitely not doing 280 of these because if I did that, I think I would lose everyone very quickly. And we're just following this up and following this along until this is, is off scale. What you also want to be mindful of is these PMTs uh, are typically um, linear to a certain range. Typically that range is up to about um, a little over 200,000, right? So be mindful that as you are, are off scale, you're past the point of linearity and your statistics are no longer going to be applicable. So just be mindful of that, that if something is off scale, please do not utilize the statistics for that because it's not going to be reliable for you. Okay. So I went along and I modified the gates quickly for all of these. And now what I can do is I can go back and I can utilize the statistics to be able to get a nice characterization for this specific PMT. Okay, so I'm gonna close this, right? And I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna start adding some statistics. This 210 doesn't really help us out very much because I wasn't even able to pull out the CD4 positive and negative from each other at that point. Um, so I'm gonna leave it in there, but we're gonna remem remember that for later on when we go to plot this data because it's not gonna be applicable for us. 
Okay, so we're going to utilize the stain index and to utilize that stain index, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to workspace, go to statistics and add a statistic. Okay, so this is nice because it lets us see all these different um, aspects of Flojo. We're on the APC positive, so I'm going to go to median. It's on APC positive here and I'm going to select this APC parameter. Okay. Once I hit add, we have that statistic right there. Then from negative, I'm going to go ahead and change that to negative, leave that on APC and add that there as well. So you see our median for APC is 0.63. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add in the uh, standard deviation of the negative for APC. Okay, so now that I have those statistics added, what I could do is I can come in and I can do an analysis of this one detector to see a nice range of stain index as we do our voltration or our voltage walk-up. So to carry that out, I'm gonna to come to the table editor right here, and I'm going to drag in the median of the APC positive. And I could have um, and selected all of these at once, or I can come back and select these after. So if, you, uh, if I'd wanted to select all of these at one time, I utilize the command key on the Mac or control key on a PC and drag them in all at the same time. Okay, so I'll delete that secondary positive MFI just by hitting delete on my keyboard and hit yes. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in a formula. So um, for people who have been joining us a couple of times, you'll have seen this already, um, but this is a good reiteration. So you go ahead and you go to add column and then you go, come over to the formula tab. When I do that, I try typing in a column heading. So I'll type in stain index here. And then that's going to be the heading that pops up as I formulate this table. And when I'm in the actual um, box right here, I can start typing in that formula. So I start off with uh, two parentheses. And if I come down to insert reference, it's automatically going to understand uh, and, and have populated those different statistics that I dragged into the table editor. Okay, so I'm going to look at the MFI of the positive minus the MFI of the negative. Okay, then I can close those parentheses. And you'll see if I did not do it correctly, what's going to happen is you're going to have this little red error bar right here. It's telling me it doesn't make sense. You're missing uh, a part of the equation. And once I um, round that out with the second uh, parentheses, that's gone. But I still need to divide that by two times the standard deviation. So if I come in here and I put in two times and then I can put the standard deviation of the negative and hopefully I didn't make any mistakes. Should Rui will correct me if I, if I did, if I'm foggy brained, but now I have MFI of the positive minus MFI of the negative and we um, have that over two times the standard deviation of the negative, okay? I'm so gonna... one of the questions here is that, um, you know, why are you using uh, standard deviation and not robust standard deviation? So once you're doing the, um, the two times the standard deviation, it essentially, um, Rui, again, correct me a little bit better on this, it, it corrects for um, and, and makes it a little bit more of a robust standard deviation because you're, you're accounting for that with the two times. Um, if you want a little bit of a deeper uh, explanation into the statistics, I would defer to Rui on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there are multiple um, papers that we can reference you to on the, uh, on the different, um, whether it's separation index, stain index, um, there are different formulas available um, that, mm -hmm. and papers that might go a little bit deeper into that for you. Yeah, I would say in general, it's always good to, to use a robust measurement. And, and, and so I would say it's probably better to use the robust standard deviation. Um, but it's you know something very simple to put in the formula that you can compare side by side using the yeah. robust standard deviation and standard deviation, and then seeing if if that curve that you're going to end up having with the stain indexes uh, will be will be the same or not. Yeah, that's a good point, and we could even do that here and 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 have that um, like live through the through the classroom where we're taking a look at both. Mm -hmm. Can I can I so there's somebody else also asking um, if the program. Uh, how do you ask the program to show your count instead of frequency on the plot? How do you go ahead and show frequency? Uh, let me go ahead, let me hit OK here, mm -hmm. and then I can go back, because that's going to be um, in the preferences, I believe. So if we go to preferences right here, so this little, um, this little heart, it's been a little while since I've done this, but yeah, if, we go, um, if we go to gates, huh, you yeah. see here in the layout annotation, I've, I've spoken about 
previously about the option to change where the gate is annotated. So is it inside of the gate, above, below, all of that. So I prefer above, so I'd set that um, at a previous time, but instead of frequency, um, you can do percentage, population medians. Um, there are different options there for what you can have automatically show up. And then there are also other options in the layout editor itself that we can explore once we uh, drag populations in there. So I could also show that a little bit later. Okay, so now here, um, when we go to table editor, if I go ahead and I go to create the table, when I create the table right here, what you'll see is it automatically pops up and it's giving me uh, the MFI, the positive, the negative, the, the standard deviation, and we could do the side by side with RSD now, and then also the stain index, okay? So you can either uh, create the table to display like I just did, or you can create it to a file, like a CSV, Excel, text, anything like that. Uh, if you wanted to do it to an Excel file and I wanted to just do it right on the desktop, I would just click where it says destination, change it to desktop right here, and I can put SDAPC, and we'll do another one for RSD. I'll hit save, and we can create that table. Once I create the table, you'll see it's right here on my desktop. It's very quick. And if I open that up, it's going to have all those statistics that I, um, that I wanted to go ahead and, and look at. Now, very, very quickly, all I have to do, if I wanted to create um, a plot with this, if I start off with voltage, I know that my starting was 210, and I can just do a quick A2 plus 30. I can go ahead and delete the rest of these, because I don't need them, and I can come down and I can go down to six, uh, it was 660. So you had some uh, other data in there that we didn't need for mean and uh, standard deviation that I'm gonna go ahead and delete. And I can delete these other parameters if I'm not interested in them, or what I can do is I can come down here and I can look at the voltage, and then I can look at the stain index, and I can insert a plot and I can do this, uh, this, this scatter with a, with a line right there. And what I'm able to see now is I'm able to see the point where the stain indices is, is coming up, 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 and then it does a, a pretty much a plateau. It's gonna potentially wobble a little bit, but what you can see, there's no drastic changes. And at this value of about 400 um, to, to four, um, or 420 to 450 or so, we're seeing a nice plateau, and we can use that as our optimal PMT voltage. Um, and what I'd like to note is that this theoretically should be independent of, um, of the fluorochromes that you're working with. So this is more of um, a characterization of the PMT itself and not the different fluorochromes. Okay. You can always optimize this in Excel. This isn't an Excel class, but if I go ahead and I format the axis, I can take a little bit of a, a closer look here and have the minimum start at 210, which is our starting value. Um, you, can, you can always format it, make it however, look however you want. Um, so there's all these different options for you um, to format your, your plots and everything like that. But it's very, very easy to go ahead and quickly get a nice characterization of that detector. Okay, everyone's interested in seeing the RSD, we can do that also. I'll go ahead and I'll add another one. Um, so I'm just adding a table through this little addition uh, right there. And I can go back to workspace, statistic, add, and we'll do a nice side by side. Okay, so we have the median, we have median and robust standard deviation. We'll get a little bit more practice with doing that formula again. So two parentheses, we'll want to do the MFI of the positive minus MFI of the negative. Okay. Close that up. And then I'm going to have two times Oh, the robust standard deviation right here. I'm going to call this robust. Okay. Now, if I then 
I can go ahead and create that to display. And if I want it, I can then copy it to a clipboard by just coming up to do edit and copy table to clipboard. And I can go back to that oops, Excel sheet that was right here. Oops. It didn't copy quite as well as I'd, I'd want it to. Um, I'm not used to working on the Mac, so I'm not sure if I missed out on something there. So let me just do it to, to a file again. So while you're doing that, um, you know, that there have been a, a few questions here mm -hmm. um, regarding, so we decided to use stain index this time, right? And some people are asking, so why are not we using separation index that you had mentioned before? Um, and, you know, is it preferentially used for antibody titration? Because you, you used it before in, in, in the example of antibody titration in, in another class. So I've used both, honestly, and they're pretty interchange. They're they're somewhat interchangeable. So you're still taking into account um, and into account the negative. And it's if someone was just looking at the MFI of the positive over the negative and leaving it at that, I wouldn't be happy with that because then you're just looking at um, the MFIs without taking into account the spread of the negative. So these formulas are nice in that um, they do take into account the the negative. And I have done side by sides with um, with both, and they're pretty correlative with each other for the applications that we're looking to use. So the reason behind showing multiple is that you know you have options there, explore them, see which one you prefer, what's best for you. But I'm not going to advocate one over the other for being better. I'll Absolutely. say that um, they're they're both pretty interchangeable. Yep. yep. Ahead and open that up again. You guys are being very patient with me, so thank you. Oh, it went to 690. Oops. Oops. Okay, I'll just calculate this here. Okay, so I'm going to copy this and paste that there and the sustain index. So this is the one with the RSD, and let's see what that looks like. And highlighting all of those. As you guys can see, I'm at my parents' house during this pandemic, so they're being very kind to me, <laughs> um, letting me use their computer, which has a little bit better internet than mine. Um, and it, it gets me a little bit sometimes. Okay. So I'm going to format this axis again. We'll start there at a minimum of 200. And what do we see? we see that this, I, I would make essentially the same determination there, sometime, uh, a value between 420 and 450. So the, the utilization of the RSD, um, you, you can absolutely utilize that, but um, for these purposes, it did not make a major difference as we're, we're going along. Um, you see it might, might have had a little bit of a lower uptick there on that variation around 510 uh, or so, but um, to me, in my eyes, when I look at this and I'm just trying to get an inf information on where it's plateauing, that information is not changing. Okay. So I think um, that's a good example of how you'd go ahead and individually uh, characterize a detector. And remember, what we're doing is we're going to go ahead and do that for all of our detectors. What winds up happening as we're going along for sake of time, because it's 145, so I'm not going to show you another detector, I can go ahead and open up a characterization that a, number, a, a member of our facility, um, Joanna, had done um, very beautifully where she took a look and she did um, these calculations for all detectors uh, on, across all instruments. You'll see we also plotted the uh, RSD of the negative. That's a separate discussion. We're st strictly looking at just the stain index or the um, separation index for this data, but we have it across um, all different detectors as we're going along. Okay. What you also see here is the next thing I'm going to show you, which is how we can actually concatenate that data from that detector uh, into one file so that we can get a nice visualization. Okay, but you can see this is what the data would look like on our end from our, from our instruments. Okay. Close this up. I'm going to go back into APC. And for anyone that's um, joined before, you saw this with the titration, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to click uh, Control 
or Command Shift E here, and you saw all of my single cell uh, nodes were selected. Alternatively, what I could have done is I could have selected on single cells, came to edit, and done select equivalent nodes. Or from single cells, you can right click and select equivalent nodes. So there's always more than one way to do something in Flojo. Okay, I'm gonna right click then, and I'm going to go ahead, again, mouse I'm not used to. Um, I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna concatenate those populations. So you have an option that's export or concatenate. By concatenating, I'm bringing all those individual FCS files into one. Okay, I'm gonna leave it as the FCS3. For destination, I'm going to change that destination so it's going um, just directly onto the desktop for now. Okay, this way I can easily find it. And I'm going to call it APC Concat. Okay, now when I, I'm not going to change any of these other um, settings, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hit concatenate. And I'm going to put it into the existing workspace. And if you're mindful, you saw that this APC concatenation uh, FCS file was right here. Okay, I'm going to close that up. And once I come on here and I, I select this, what you'll see is that everything's falling within that scatter gate. Remember, because I, I did that um, concatenation from the single file uh, or single cell gate for each one, it's only concatenating the events that fell within that original scatter and single cell gating. Okay, so I don't even need to bother with all of the gating. What I can do now though on the x-axis is I can choose sample ID, which becomes a keyword when you're going ahead and doing the concatenation. And you can see I have all these files that are here. And I don't care about side scatter, it's gonna be the same for all of them. But what I do care about is APC. So when I go to APC then I can get that very nice, very clear voltage walk up. And as we're going along, we can use that as a nice visual uh, in addition to our statistics to be able to, to determine where our optimal um, PMT voltage would be. Now, keep in mind, we're using this for lymphocytes, um, lyophilized lymphocytes. This is a good starting point. It's a good starting point for characterization if you're working with PBMT is great. You might be working with some other cell types. You might be working with alveolar macrophages. You might be working with um, you might be working with, with liver, you might be working with some highly autofluorescent cells. This is not a voltage that we say is an end all for everything. It's a nice starting point for you to make sure your, um, your separation or your, you know, is, is as you would want it to be to start off. Um, because you're at the point where it's plateauing for that PMT. If your data is off scale, um, from a positive perspective, you'd want to make sure you take that into account. Um, there are a lot of different considerations, but um, this is a good starting point for us. Right. Can I, can I just um, add something there? Because um, there, there have been some questions regarding, you know, the, the influence of different antibodies on, on this um, characterization or um, different fluorochromes, et cetera. And I think it's important to, to note here, to understand that this instrument characterization is trying to, um, so we're trying here to find the, the, the minimum voltage that will give us maximum separation. Yes. Okay? Yeah. And we could use a very high voltage and you know, almost be sure that we have maximum separation. The problem is like, like uh, Kathy was saying now, if the voltage is too high, then your data may be off scale, right? With whatever antibody you, you use. So here really the idea is to um, use the negative cells that you are interested in measuring. Um, and so, you know, Kathy is using these lyophilized um, uh, lymphocytes, right? So this would be great for lymphocytes. Um, and what we're trying really to do is to find that voltage where the separation index doesn't change anymore because now um, we, the signal is completely um, above the electronic noise, right? Um, so as long as the, the signal is above the electronic noise, your stain index should be, you know, in theory, always the same. So the separation should be always the same. So this is what we're trying to do. So it only depends on the negative uh, cells um, and not on the fluorochrome, or at least it shouldn't, and not on the antibody. Once you find the, the, the right voltage, then you can start doing titration of your own specific antibody. Yes, and there's also, um, so that's something absolutely that's very critical. And the other thing that we're gonna go do is, next we're gonna go into, um, determination of the, of the spillover spread for the instrument um, with, the, with the fluorochromes that you have for the CD4 kit. And remember, that's fluorochrome dependent, right? So 
just because we're characterizing these PMTs, what's still going to wind up happening is you're going to have to uh, optimize your panel, but you have a nice starting point for it. And what you can do is you have a nice starting point for voltages. And if the fluorochromes that were used for the CD4 walk up line up with your panel, you'll get a nice idea of the spread and, and smart panel design that you can utilize um, when characterize or when, when looking at this. Okay. Are there any more questions before we move forward to that slide? Yeah, there's actually here an interesting question um, on, you know, if you have, let me see, um, if you have two uh, equal uh, stain indices uh, values um, at two different voltages, which one would you choose, the lowest one or the highest one? Why? So what I, what I would typically tend to do is I would start a little bit lower, right? I if you have the same stain indices across two, what I would do is I would start with that lower one because then what winds up happening is you're giving yourself a little bit more room for high expressors at a starting point, right? Um, the other the other thing that might wind up happening to you is you might um, you might hit a point where it maybe it doesn't plateau. I, I'm not going to tell you that the stain indices is always going to plateau, and the recommendation by uh, Florian and, and Aaron in that uh, in that chapter, which which I uh, agree with, is is a nice starting point. You can set the positive peak at about sixty thousand for an MFI, and then that gives you a nice range for. Um, being able to capture some dim expressors below that and also being able to express some uh, or find um, the the high expressors and you're, you're at a point with this CD4 at 60,000 where you're able to have a little bit of a, a wiggle room and a range. So mm -hmm. I would either um, take a look at that and see what the MFI is and try and get it a little closer to 60,000 or what I would do is, um, is just use the lower so that I have a little bit more uh, working room. Right, yeah. and there's also a good point um, from Deanna uh, saying that, um, you know, with the lower one, you also are more likely to reduce spread, right, or to see less spread. Yes, uh, and that's... And you can see that in this plot, right? Um, as you increase the voltage, you do get a bit uh, higher spread of the negatives. Yeah, and that's another reason why we wanted to talk about, or why I mentioned earlier, the, the importance of washing, because what you might see with certain fluorochromes as you're putting, in, um, putting them in there, and this is something that we're looking to, to study in our lab a little bit um, because we've seen this data from, from, from other talks, is that sometimes with those polymer dyes, you might see a spread of that negative where every, everything is not just shifting up, but you're seeing more of the spread. Um, and for our initial run, we, we kind of went through it a little bit quick and we didn't do as many washes as we should have. And we, and we saw that, that spread of the negative. Um, so that's, that's something to consider. But then when talking about spread in the sense of, um, you know, the combination of fluorochromes and the photon counting error that, that introduces that spread, the higher the signal is, the more spread they'll be into that secondary detector. And, um, and we'll show you how to look for that secondary, or for this, the spread matrix, rather. Um, the other thing that I should have mentioned earlier is that there, there is also um, a method called the PEAK2 method um, or there's a method where you can um, take unstained cells and spike in beads and do the same voltage walk as opposed to looking at um, the CD4. So that is another approach. Um, it's not the one that we're going over today, but there are a variety of them available. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do um, next, right, I told you how to do the concatenation. And um, if you wanted to get that concatenation um, plot, if you open up the layout editor, if I just drag in um, that file, it's showing me sample ID, APC, like it's showing me everything that I can go ahead and then put into a PowerPoint, an Excel, whatever you'd like. You can always go ahead and um, export the image right there. So I can export an image. You have the option to do um, PNG, JPEG, um, I, GIF, GIF, I don't know, people debate on what to say with that. Um, I think I had friends recently tell me they wouldn't be friends with me anymore for the way I pronounced it. Um, but you have so many options, that's the point of me saying that. And then for the layout editor itself, you can always um, batch it, um, you know, and you can create a PDF, a PowerPoint. There's, there's so many different options for you here that we've gone over in previous sessions. But know that that is an option for you. Okay. 
So then what I want to discuss next is I want to discuss this spillover spread. And once you have all of those individual optimal PMT voltages, how you would go in and, and characterize that. And that's actually really nice and easy. And for anyone that's been involved in the previous session on compensation, it's going to look very similar. Okay, so I'm going to close out of that. I'm going to create a new workspace, actually. So I'm going to go to um, right here. I'm going to go to new workspace. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up this folder. And I just, what I did as opposed to, um, to going ahead and having all those optimized PMTs, um, what you have to remember is the, when you're characterizing this, I can't just bring in the optimal PMT for one file and then the optimal PMT for another file. Um, because if, if the detectors have different voltages, you won't be able to characterize this, um, if that makes sense. So what I did, did for this purpose for today, um, because of limited availability of FCS files, was I decided let's just start off with 510 volts and let's arbitrarily say that those are our optimal PMT voltages, right? Just to show you quickly how we go ahead and characterize um, and, and determine the spillover spread. So if I drag those in, what you'll see, if I come to compensation, I can't do anything. You might say compensation, you're trying to do spillover spread. It's actually from the same tool that we can do that. Okay. So I'm going to come to all samples and I'm actually going to move that over. I'm going to select all those files and I'm going to bring them into compensation. Okay. Um, you'll see the spillover spread is so, so easy. So this is going to be a nice tool for everyone if you haven't seen it. I'm going to come to compensation. And because I have more detectors that are open than I actually had FCS files, I need to just pick the, um, the parameters that I'm going to be looking at for this. So I know that the only one that I didn't have was the PE Sci 55. So that's the only one that I'm going to deselect. Be nice if I could do it. Sorry. And again, not the usual uh, computer I work with. I'm used to working with um, PC a little more. Okay, so um, I'm selecting all the parameters for all the FCS files I have, and the PE Sci 55 is not one of the um, one of the FCS files I had. I had PE Sci 5, but not Sci 55. So I'm choosing those selected parameters, and this is a nice little refresher for anyone who hasn't done compensation in Flojo. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that the parameter name and the sample name are all correct. So if I scroll down, size 7, APCR 700, all of these, very briefly going through, all make sense, okay? So even though the detector name itself doesn't match up exactly, I know that that's the correct detector for, um, for that sample. You're going to see a couple of different things. You have the green light here that's telling me, all right, everything's all good. It matches up. Um, I'm good to go. If I see a red, it's telling me it's missing a population that's not going to be able to calculate anything, right? So Alexa 700 is missing a population. When I scroll down, I can very easily see what that is. For anyone that's joined our previous sessions, it went around the debris. So I know that the APC and the APC size 7 population for size is good. So I'm simply going to drag that up to compensation, and it's going to now correct for that, OK? And I'm going to just modify by double clicking on this plot, the positive and the negative to make sure that that gating is just how I want it to be. The most important thing is that I'm around the brightest part of the positive, but the negative is well encompassed. So I'm going to briefly go through and check all of these. Um, if anyone wants a deeper explanation for this, for compensation, please go ahead and look at our uh, website and on the second session we went over this, okay? But please ask questions if you have them now. I'd be happy to answer. Yes. So actually, there's an example. There's a, there's a question here. Mm -hmm. And I, I missed what you were saying because I was answering somebody else. Um, uh, somebody's asking, did you say the 510 is just an example voltage? Yes. Yes. So 100%. What I did just to show you how you would determine a spillover spread was I took the 510 voltage for all of these FCS files and brought them in. What you would want to do is characterize the instrument, do all of this data analysis and say, okay, let me set my APC voltage at 510 or whatever it was, 450, um, my Alexa 700 at 500, my Fitzy at 420. Exactly. And then what you do is you record the individual FCS files for all those single colors for the panel that you're looking to do or for the fluorocone combination that you're looking to do with those voltages. 
and all of them will have their separate, unique, individual optimal PMT voltages. Um, so the reason I, I did this all for 510 was just for an example, right? This is far from the optimal for each detector. It's more for you to understand once you have those and put those in and record those FCS files, what do you do? Exactly. They would be completely different. Exactly. Um, there's mm -hmm. no reason for them to be the same. Okay. Yeah. Again, because we're all working from home, it's um, we have a little bit of limitations in the FCS files that we can we can gather. So um, you know, it's just for education. We wanted to to show you how to carry out these practices or methods rather. Here. Any other questions I can answer as I'm just modifying these a bit? Yes, there's actually a question that came out now. So you calculate optimal voltage, which is two, time, two and a half times or three times the, the robust standard deviation using non-stained cells, then do voltage titration by doing what is shown here. Afterwards, do antibody titration. If it's a different antibody with same fluorochrome, that's the question. So different antibody, um, different antibody, same fluorochrome. So if you are looking at a different antibody, you absolutely have to do a different titration um, because all antibodies are not created equally. Um, we're actually going to be talking soon, um, be on the lookout for an antibody validation talk. But what you have to be very mindful of is that um, no two antibodies are created equally. And you have to be um, making sure that for each new vial of antibody you get, even if it's the same, uh, or uh, each new lot of antibody, if it's the same antibody fluorochondriate, you still have to titrate that because there are going to be differences. Um, I did a, a titration of the whole CD4 kit that it's the same SK3. It's uh, very, the starting uh, concentration was all the same. I had to um, go ahead and titrate each one of those vials and it was in the range of between um, 2.5 down to about like 0.3 micrograms per mil, something in that range. And that's a, that's a pretty big difference. And that's all the same um, CD4, SK3, just conjugated different fluorochromes. So you can imagine if you switch the antibody itself, you're absolutely going to need to retitrate. Right. So yeah, I mean, this was a big uh, question, so um, it needs to be broken down. And I know it's not easy <laughs> for you to, uh, you're not seeing the question, but so um, it's important to, to clarify, there are two things, right? One of them is the uh, voltage um, characterization, right? You're trying to find the optimal voltage. And what we're doing here is finding the optimal voltage using this voltage titration or voltration method. Um, uh, the two and a half or three times the robust standard deviation would be another method. Yeah, uh, that's not something that... Calculate, right. Yeah. Um, we do find, and, and you know, BD has shown that this method of two and a half times to three times the, the robust standard deviation is, is not the best method for many fluorochromes or for many channels, sorry, in the red. Um, it ends up being... Um, uh, if I remember well, it, you end up finding a, a very low voltage and it should be higher. Um, so it, it, it doesn't work universally. Yeah. I, I guess probably the best method so far is this voltage titration and still it has its caveats. Yes. And even that being said, so that, sorry, I missed out on that first part of that. Um, okay. Yeah. With the, with the two and a half times standard deviation electronic noise, um, you know, that's not sufficient to be able to get to calculate the best separation for yourself. And keep in mind that we're doing this as an initial characterization for the instrument as a starting point. What's going to be ideal for you is to, is to really go ahead and do um, um, a voltage walk up with your individually stained cells for your experiment to, to really even hone this in for your experiment, right? Not everyone has that time. So this is a nice starting point for us and it's better than using the CSNT voltages. And that's kind of our approach to this, right? Because not everyone's going to have an hour to dedicate or a half hour to dedicate to setting voltages and doing all of that. But under ideal circumstances, what you would do is you would carry this out um, with your experimental panel itself. And that would, be, that would be the golden standard. And if all of our customers had the time and the ability to do that, I think I would cry tears of joy. <laughs> Um, you know, because even us at the sorters, it can be difficult if we have a jam-packed schedule to do, to do something like this. Um, and then you do have to optimize via antibody titration, and you have to optimize, um, you know, 
based on the spillover spread that we're going to look at, um, that I'll show really sh shortly, I'm going to talk about how maybe titrating down some of your antibodies on, uh, on, on some markers that are expressed at very high levels can be beneficial to reduce the spread. So what I yeah. did now, um, if we're Sorry, there's a, there's a very good question here. Um, so under what situations would you do, would you redo the filtration uh, or the walk up? Great question. So typically this is done upon installation of the instrument and then our, our lab is looking to do it um, on a routine basis, not every week by any means, not every month, but more on the basis of potentially uh, twice a year to annually or with any major interventions, right? If you have to have um, any uh, PMTs swapped out, if, if you're doing some major filter changes or anything like that, because it's a, um, you're, you're characterizing those, those PMTs and really getting a, a good idea for how things are, are, um, are looking for those detectors. So if you change any of those out or do major interventions to the instrument, I would highly suggest carrying it out again um, you know, for laser changes, all of that, you, you might want to reconsider uh, doing it again. And the nice thing is that it's a pretty easy protocol to, to put forward, but you would not have to do this on a weekly or, or monthly basis or anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now when I go through, what I see is everything's either yellow or green. Yellow is okay. Typically it comes up with that if the sample name itself doesn't, um, doesn't really vibe, right? So if it says AM cyan for the parameter, but you ran BB510, you know that that's the same parameter, so you're fine with it. So I checked all those, but if you see the yellow, don't fret, okay? Not resonance energy transfer, but worry. <laughs> I can't help a good pun. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit view matrix, okay? So be mindful, if something was not right, I can't view the matrix. Right, so if I had no events there and that positive, I can't, but once I have those events there and that single color, I can. Okay. I'm gonna view that matrix. And then what winds up happening here, it's showing me the compensation, okay? It's showing me the compensation, it's showing me uncompensated versus compensated, but that's not the purpose of what I'm trying to do today. I'm not trying to look at this panel. I'm trying to get an idea of these fluorochromes and how they interact with each other and how the spread is going to be, okay? So very simply, all I have to do is click SSM and I can either display it right here or I can export, right? So I'm gonna hit export. And when I do that, we're gonna put it on the desktop. So this one's, um, it's a BB515, BB700 combination. Cause I have another um, two fluorochromes where we can combine it with Percy P555 and Fitzy if we want to see the difference there, just to show you guys how it is fluorochrome dependent. So if we have the time, I can show you that. But I'm going to go ahead and hit save. Okay, I'm going to move myself. Well, I might have opened that up the wrong program. I did. Okay, I'm going to open that with Excel. Okay, and there it is, we have a spill of spread. These numbers are arbitrary, so I'm not going to tell you which one, uh, which number is a threshold or anything like that. But what I'm gonna do is I'm going to highlight all of these. Conditional formatting, I can very easily set a color scale for myself and use whatever one you find. Oh, not that one, I don't like that one. <laughs> um, let me just do this one. Um, and it's going to highlight these higher values. So typically when this um, pops out, what we're going to see here is this per CP or right here, uh, or Q.605, um, that's the, the, the primary. And then this Q.705 is the spillover, the secondary where we're seeing that spread. I can double check that real quick because sometimes I, I confuse myself a little bit on that and I always double check. Um, but what, what I want to see now is I want to see, all right, for this Q.605 channel and this Q.705 channel, what is that spread really looking like? Okay. So now I, I have that. And what I would want to do potentially for that is to see like, all right, what is that spread looking like for me? So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going, I'm going to um, not display the SSM anymore. And I'm actually going to go ahead and I'm going to apply this compensation to all samples because once when the data is uncompensated, you're not going to see that spread. It's very important that I uh, clarify here that 
compensation does not cause the spread, right? Um, that's a that's a, um, that's a that's a notion that's out there that that's not correct. It's it's about the photon counting error, um, and that the photon counting error that you'll see causing the spread of the data. And what's going to happen is the higher you go, and the uh, the higher expression there is, and the higher it is on the scale, you're going to see more spreading. Okay. Um, so just be mindful that because you have a compensation value of 100, it doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to have a crazy high spread or anything like that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this Q.605, which I believe is going to be my BV605, and I'm going to look at that in comparison with the um, BV711. Okay, so if I open this file up, I can then come here and I can look at the comp. 605, comp, 705, and what do we see here? Um, one, the data might look a little bit off to you and you might wonder why, it's because we don't have that many events here that we usually would have, it's, it's automatically smoothing it. That's fine for us for visualization purposes, so I'm leaving it, but what do we see here? We see this spread and we know that this is um, a single color, of just BV605. And we got that nice indicator from this spillover spread matrix to tell us that that BV605 um, is going to spill over into the secondary of the BV705. Okay. And that is something that's going to happen. You see the spread is increasing as we go higher, right? So you see these monocytes that might be um, CD4 dim are not seeing as much of a spread, but as we go higher and higher, we're seeing that spread increase. And that is to be expected, which is why um, I think Diana was mentioning before, you can actually use this to your advantage and potentially if you have a primary marker that's expressed and you have a very clear differentiation between positive and negative and it's got a high expression level, you can actually titrate your antibody down a little bit to reduce this spread, okay? So that's something you can absolutely do. Now, if I was curious and I was saying, oh, is, well, what about this BV711 into BV605, right? I'm gonna utilize the, um, the overlay tool for this just to show you um, why we're not necessarily seeing BV605, uh, 711 into, into 605. Okay, so I'm gonna open up the layout tool and 605 sample, I'm gonna drag that sizing gate right in there. And here what we see, the plot didn't automatically come up with the axes name, so if I double click on it, and if I go to annotate, where it says Y axis, sometimes this might happen to you, I'm just gonna um, not make sure they're not hidden. Okay, and you can also uh, choose whether or not you want frequency, um, frequency, frequency values shown or not. Okay. I don't have a gate there, so it's not going to give me a frequency. And then I'm going to come to the BV711, and I'm going to drag that same file in for an overlay. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing the most beautiful example of spread and lack of spread. So if I want to make this a little bit easier to see, if I come and double click and specify, I can use large dots and apply that right, because we don't have so many events there. And if I come back to my spillover spread, what am I seeing? Um, I'm seeing exactly what I mentioned, right, where that BV605 uh, is going to spread from, the, uh, if it's the, the primary, into the BV711, right here with this 10.26 value. BV711 into BV605 is 0.6. So what are we seeing? We're seeing on that single color BV711 right here, the positive is not spilling over into that secondary detector. For the BV605, what's happening is that positive is causing that spread and we're losing resolution. So if you can imagine, I'm just gonna take this little line, the negative for BV605 is there. Because of the spread, because of the, uh, the poison error and photon counting, what's happening? We're losing this range, okay? We're losing that amount. So if we had, oops, if we had to then design a panel, why does that matter to us? What matters is I could say, okay, I know if I'm just trying to pull out a marker that's on two mutually exclusive cells, 
on BV605 uh, BV and BV711, that's fine. If I have a very high spread here and a, a, a spread here, even if I did have that spread, if there are mutually exclusive populations, I don't have to worry about that all too much, right? But if I'm trying to work, um, if I'm trying to put BV711 on a marker, right, that has very low level of expression and it's co-expressed with BV605, what's going to happen, right? So if I want this BV605 to go a little bit higher, I'm gonna do that. So I just click and drag to make that higher so I can uh, show you a little bit of a better example of this. If I expected my, my panel that I'm designing to have a marker that's expressing BV605 at a high level, but expect, uh, expressing a marker that is, uh, you got an antibody conjugated to BV711 at a low level, what could potentially happen there? you can have something where your positive for BV711 is falling within that spread there, and you're not able to really pull it out, okay? A really nice example of that is in that PowerPoint that I mentioned, so I'm just gonna make this a little bit bigger as opposed to starting, not so big. So you're gonna wind up with scenarios where you're either gonna have uh, like a low expressing marker on something that's high spread, where you're not going to be able to pull that out. Right, so you're not able to resolve that. But if you're able to, um, to use it to your advantage and, and understand the biology of your experiment and design a little bit better, you would potentially be able to resolve out populations. But ideally, if you have two fluorochromes um, that are going to have an interaction with each other and you're gonna see a little bit more in the way of spread, what I'd rather you do is design your panel so that you're avoiding those combinations together, okay? Now, again, I want you to remember that this is a multi-step process, okay? So what you're going to do first is you're going to come in and you're going to do this calculation um, of spillover spread, but you have to do it with the fluorochromes that you're looking to utilize. Um, I can show you if we calculated spillover spread utilizing FITSI and Percy piece um, Sci-55 as opposed to utilizing BB515 um, and BB700, how that's gonna change a little bit because we um, put in all of the fluorochromes for this. But that's a very quick um, you know, explanation of what we're going to be doing in order to, to characterize our instruments, to be able to get an idea of the, the spreading of different fluorochromes with each other, and then why and how we would use that to design a panel. The other thing um, that I want to briefly touch on, if you'll remember, okay. I did that characterization. Before, yeah. you, before you leave that table, uh, there was somebody just commenting that um, it was copy pasted uh, one yeah. row down. Yeah, so the there was, I, I did notice that, yeah, <laughs> so, uh, just towards the end. So thank you for that. Yeah, that was, um, that was not um, perfectly correct. So I'll have to adjust the, just that because everything kind of um, shifted. So actually, we did see the spread, the spread on the, the key dot 605. I'm trying to try to get away with that. Um, but then it, it should be a little bit more actually for per CP. So that's a very good point. Thank you for bringing that up. But let me see if I bring up the per CP. Um, we should may potentially see it a little bit just here. Let's do, let's do that. Thank you very much for that. I, I caught that towards the very end. That's the importance of choosing your data. Okay, so there you go. There you have it. Um, this is an example of the per CP versus the BV711, and that's even um, more than the BV605 versus 711. So if I if I do it here, it might be a little bit harder to see. And these numbers again are arbitrary, but you're seeing that there is spread for the um, BB605 uh, BB into BB711 and also for the BB700 into BB, uh, BB711, right? So we're seeing both of those right there. We can't overlay those two because they're based on different parameters on the x-axis, but what you can see is even for a value of, of three versus 10, you're still seeing some high spread there. And um, if I brought that in, thank you for, for pointing that out. And I come here, and I take a look at that. 
and I show our numbers, our Libra. Um, so you see here that spreading, one, two, to expect that third tick where it's here, it's only about, about there for the spreading. So we have a higher spreading for BB700 into BB711 than we do for the BB605 into BB711. That's a really good uh, clarification, so thank you for that. Uh, and be careful how you copy and paste. <laughs> um, the other thing that you wanna go ahead and take into account when you're, when you're doing this is remember you're getting the stain indices, um, the optimal stain indices as you're doing this voltage walk up, right? So you're seeing a point where the stain indices plateaus for the most part. And what you can do with that is you can take that stain indices or separation indices with the 0.995 um, or, the, or the 84th percentile, the negative, you know, that you can use those different formulas. And as long as you're using the same formula across, what you, uh, what you can do is you can compare with the optimal PMT voltage per detector all of those individual fluorochromes. So what's nice in this, in this one run that you're doing to characterize, you're not only getting optimal PMT voltages, but you can also go ahead and plot the separation or the stain indices for individual fluorochromes. And then what does that enable you to do? That enables you to get a per instrument characterization on how bright your fluorochromes are. Because remember, you can't compare Fortessa 1 to Fortessa 2 unless they've been standardized to each other. Lasers are going to be different as far as laser power go. Maybe, um, maybe the UV on one is 30 milliwatts and it's 50 on another. Okay, You're going to have differences in your stain indices there. So um, PMTs are going to be different. I've seen two instruments installed side by side that were twins that we did this characterization on and we were able to actually identify and pull out some PMTs that needed to be a little bit more far red sensitive and we had to get them replaced based on this comparison with the, with the separation index or stain indices. Um, the other thing is you, you, you want to make it sure that your, your filter setups are right, all of that. This takes into account all of this, but really what it's going to be is an instrument specific determination of the brightness of the fluorochromes, okay? And you can then use this to your advantage in combination with that spillover spread, okay? To be able to determine what the brightest floors are for that instrument. And then you can pair those bright floors with markers that are expressed at a low level, or it might see a little bit of a spread um, so that you can pull them out a bit better specific to the instrument and make sure that they're paired together with other um, markers that aren't going to have a high level of spread, okay? So th these are all different things that you're getting from, from this run. Um, and then the second run for spillover spread with those optimal PMTs that you can really use to your advantage to make a much more beautiful panel than you would just by looking in the fridge, right? Like the fridge panel that some people might utilize. So. This is just the general overview of what you can do uh, very easily to make yourself um, and your life that much, that much better when you're trying to carry out some panel design. Um, so if people want to see the, the other spillover spread with, um, with the different fluorochromes, we could explore that. We can open, up, open it up to questions. Um, this was not a two hour session today, so it's a little bit shorter. Um, but I'll say let's probably open it up to any questions that people might have. How are we looking, Rui? Yeah, sorry, I was having a hard time uh, <laughs> clicking the unmute button. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, oh, so, so comprehensive enough. Right. So, I mean, there's been a, a very interesting discussion on many things um, not related to Flojo, as, as we expected, right? Uh, on instrument characterization, etc. Uh, there was there was an interesting question that, that that came up. I'm seeing now a few of them come up, and I'll I'll take a look at them. But there was one previously on um, on balancing PMTs, right? And and you and I have discussed a lot about this. Um, you know whether somebody should you know, then readjust the, the voltages if they find that the compensations are, are, are not uh, appropriate um, uh, or, you know, if there's any other reason to, to uh, readjust your, your PMTs uh, once you've done the filtration. So in my, in my previous flow life, um, I had done some PMT balancing um, 
you know, now I, I really do not. I think it's nice to see um, actually in that, in that chapter by Aaron and Florian, they, they actually show some, some data to show different for us um, compensation values and, and how the data looks and, and everything like that. So some people might think, oh, it's 110%. I can't have that. I got a warning in Diva or I got a warning in whatever software. It showed up yellow or red or whatever it is. Look at your look at your panel. See how it looks. A compensation value of over a hundred is not a bad thing. Okay. You can have that happen and it's perfectly fine. What you're gonna wind up have um wind up doing in these scenarios. If you start adjusting voltages dramatically, bringing them down, anything like that, what's going to happen is you're going to start losing resolution. So I, um, I, I don't, and we don't at MSK um, advocate for balancing PMTs. Um, if anyone was very, very, um, what's the word? If, if they were very ardent on doing it, if they really, really wanted to do it, the only thing I would ever suggest, never decrease the voltage, increase it. Um, you know, because you're starting to lose resolution. But then remember at that point, um, you know, you're, you're starting to, to lose the range that you have between your positive and negative. So I would just be mindful and not be too concerned if, if compensation values are at 100 or over. If they're a thousand, <laughs> that might be a little bit different. You might wanna optimize your PMTs a little bit. What you'll wind up seeing is in the negative, um, if I could draw it out, you're gonna wind up seeing an artifact in the negative Whereas opposed to having a nice um, population is going to come up, you're going to see something like this, right? You're going to see that spreading of the negative with very high compensation values, and that's to be expected there. Um, but I wouldn't um, necessarily advocate for the balancing of PMTs. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I don't see any reason to, to balance at all um, yeah. because worst case scenario, well, best case scenario, we would end up with the same resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, worst case, you may end up losing that resolution, right? Exactly. And, and, and I'm completely agnostic about voltage, even voltage values. Um, even if you have the maximum voltage, yeah, maybe the PMT is not performing it at, at its best, but, um, but as long as you get maximum resolution, um, shouldn't be really a, a, a problem there. Um, there was, right, there was another question. Oh yeah, and, and you did mention one good reason to, to adjust the voltages, which would be if, if uh, the data is off scale, once you titrate your antibody or you, you, know, um, you, you run your sample and you see that things are off scale, then yeah, you, you should decrease. The, the voltage are actually better than that if you can um, uh, reduce the amount of antibody, um, that would actually be better um, because like this, you still maintain the, the resolution in case um, you know, other conditions, uh, you don't have as much expression and you still uh, guarantee the maximum separation there. Yeah, so what you can imagine here, as you see on this plot that I have, if it was BV605 and you had it on a primary, um, you know, and you had it on a primary detector, which pro or a primary marker, which probably would make the most sense because it's one of the brighter fluorochromes on this, um, on this setup. If you titrate it down, the spread goes down. So if you have something that's going to be co-expressed and you really were tied down, uh, your hands were tied with what antibodies you can use. If you titrate that down, you're still going to get the positive and negative and you're still gonna get that resolution on that marker and you'll be able to pull out um, better due to reduced spread that secondary detector and that marker that you're looking for. So that's where the, the titration of the antibody itself from a biological perspective is going to, to aid you quite a bit. Yeah. So there's a, a good question here also um, where, um, so after determining the optimal PMT, how do you go ahead uh, and use this in your everyday experiments? Do you always use the same voltages? Um, what if you want to compare between different experiments with, with MFIs? So um, if you want to compare, there, there's two sides to that question. So I'm going to answer them separately. The first um, is, okay, you have these optimized PMT voltages that either yourself or the core facility has provided to you. Um, and if, if we have MSK people on, which I believe we do, um, we just recently wrapped up some of this characterization and we are going to start implementing this. Um, so, so don't wonder, <laughs> oh, you have this, why haven't I seen it? Uh, it's because this took a, quite a bit of a uh, effort to get this data analyzed, which is why we wanna optimize um, automated analysis. That being said, um, I digress a little bit there. 
um, when you have these optimal PMTs that either you've calculated or your core facility or SRL, what I want you to do is use that as a starting point and then look at your individual cells that are, are unique to you and your experiment and with the single color cells or um, that, that you've stained up, do a, a calculation of um, of this stain index with a little bit of a voltage walk up. And you could probably start with that OPV as your, as your starting voltage and go up from there, maybe going down a little bit, 30 or 40 volts or 50 volts, um, just to have a little bit of a range, kind of like how we want a range for your antibody titration, right? So you can use that and get the optimized experiment um, values that work best for you. The second part of your question was if you wanted to compare the MFIs from another experiment. Mm -hmm. Now that is a whole separate um, can of worms and it's not a difficult thing to do, right? So um, what I always suggest to people to do, what I, what I just suggested at the very onset of your experiment, optimize your PMT voltages, get them so that you're so happy, um, the voltages or gains, whatever instrument you're working with that you, that you love your panel, okay? Then what you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to run some hard dyed beads that excite and emit in the detectors uh, and off the lasers that you're looking at. And you set target values for those beads. So say for example, these were those beads, okay? You wanna do this before it's compensated, so be mindful of that. You would set a target value. So say this was target value and we're pretending that these are beads for BB605. Okay, then the next day that I come in and I go to run, the very onset before I run my sample, I put on the same lot of those hard dyed beads. Okay, I put them on, because we know there's gonna be no degradation, and I expect this to fall in the same exact gate in the same exact area. Um, and you can define how tight you want your, your MFI range to be for that. But you would then do that for all of those individual parameters and then you're doing an in-house um, validation of um, you know, comparison from day to day and you're kind of standardizing from day to day so that you can then compare MFIs from day to day, okay? So that would be my suggestion there. If you'd already started running without, without looking at any of these standardization beads or anything like that, you can't cross compare, okay? Um, if there are specific scenarios where you're on a specific instrument, um, that, that might be a different story. We're talking about um, instruments that, that don't automatically put in standardization. So be mindful of that. I'm not making claims across every single cytometer. Um, I'm talking about CSNT, right? So if you have CSNT run from one day to the next, that does not mean you can compare MFIs from one day to the next, especially if you're, um, you're not setting uh, your voltages to hit target values on standardized particles. Yeah, I, I, so there's another, you know, um, this is related to the previous question that we were uh, talking about in terms of balancing PMTs. Uh, there's still there's still this um, notion that if you have um, compensation values, so spillover values over 100%, that that is a bad thing. And that's why you need to go and balance or redo your voltages. Let me see, um, if actually. So, yeah, and actually I think uh, Rachel, if she put, uh, um, a link uh, for a um, right. She did put a link for for a, a flow tech note. I think they have. Um, yeah, there's it's very that important is to understand. There is no problem at all in having compensation values over a hundred percent. They can be eight hundred percent. They can be a thousand two hundred percent. They can be point one two percent. So it's what Kathy uh, said before. It's about the spread counting the. Um, so it's the photon counting. It's at the time of measurement. When you apply compensation afterwards, um, there's nothing influencing the spread. So, or, or almost nothing influencing the spread. Um, so, um, so if the problem, so the problem we need to concentrate is whether we have spread or not. If we have spread, it's because, you know, maybe we don't have the, the best panel. Uh, maybe we should change the, the fluorochromes. Maybe yes. we should change the combination there of, mm -hmm. of our panel, but, um, you know, in terms of math that you apply afterwards, uh, it's irrelevant if you're, you know, applying an 800% compensation. It really doesn't influence anything at all. And this article that I brought up, New England Cytometry, it's an older one. Uh, I'm not going into the, the article itself too much, but it, it, it shows right here 
this is uncompensated and compensated and um, the FITSE spillover into PE um, caused a compensation of 315%, right? So what do we see here? We see, um, and you know, that those values are up here. I'm not just making them up. Um, you know, what do we see here? We see a, a resolution of the FITSE from the PE, even with that compensation value of 315%. And I did mention that there was going to be a little bit of a artifact there on the negative and you see that. So, you know, don't necessarily think that just because a compensation value is over 100 that your data is incorrect because we're seeing right here, um, I, don't, I just don't have an example of it to show you in Flojo, but we're seeing very clearly that those populations are resolvable. Mm -hmm. And that's why I might even have, Let's see. None of these are, oh no, some of them. So we had the Q.7 or the BV711 and per CP, right? So that's one of the ones that we, one of the ones that we talked about. So that was the, the BB700, right? So the comp value is high here, um, but but look, we're the data looks okay, right? We want to look at the n by n of everything, but that has a compensation value of three hundred and seven percent. It would give you a little bit of a warning, but it compensated, right? So just be mindful of those things. Yeah, and and the thing is, so and, and actually, I was going to mention it, and, and the question just just came 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 up. The you know, the, the problem is that a lot of vendors, and I've, I've said this in, in so many public forums, um, vendors, they set these things up, you know, just like Flojo, um, uh, Indiva from BD, uh, but any, actually, any software acquisition or analysis, they will throw these warnings, um, you know, they'll put it in red or put it in green. There, there was some time that actually um, some softwares didn't even allow you to, if you had a hundred, more than 100, they would give you an error. Um, so, you know, and, and most of the people look at this and they say, well, if the vendors are doing this, they know what they're doing. Um, and so it must be wrong to have um, uh, values, spillover values over 100%. And, and it's not true. It's not true at all. It's, it's, it has no scientific basis. Um, it was just something that was historically propagated by the, um, by the um, analog instruments. Mm -hmm. and, and with all these digital instruments, it, has, it makes no sense at all. To, to worry about these values. That's why it's actually, and I, and I would challenge anyone here um, to tell me what is the value of looking at a compensation matrix. I mean, um, you know, these, these are values that um, have no bearing at all with the spread or resolution that we're, that we're seeing. So I have, I've actually never used the compensation matrix for anything, um, you know, even to troubleshoot um, a panel. Um, it's really about the spread. The spread, yes, you're correct. And, and we want to see what the spread is in all of these channels. Yeah. Okay. And I, I hope those panel design, um, those panel design tips that I mentioned make sense, right? So why we're using this characterization um, for an initial understanding of the instrument itself, what we can garner from that as far as stain indices and, and uniqueness of fluorochromes per instrument, and then um lastly using that spillover spread which is fluorochrome dependent to, to design our panels um, in a very smart way understanding where we're going to see loss of resolution between channels um, and there's you know another metric called the resolution index matrix um i got the name of that correctly where that takes all that into account as well um, but the spillover spread is a really nice um nice way for you to start looking at that and on all of these things together will help you um to design a panel much much better mm -hmm. okay yep. does that sound good any more last questions that we have or, or I think that's good we're that's okay good. all right Thank you guys. Um, we are actually um, in in a little bit of a unique fashion. <laughs> we're not we're not gonna be announcing the next um topic throughout the week, we actually already have it. Um, so next week, uh, Dr. John Quinn from Flojo is going to be joining us. So we're gonna be introducing him um, next week and he's going to be going into high parameter analysis, including TSNI uh, and OPSNI, which is now built into Flojo and this version of Flojo. So 
Um, use the link that you've used if you haven't already signed up for next week. That's going to be High Parameter and Teasney. Um, again, follow us on Twitter where we're making all of these announcements. I'll send out the recording of this um, today at some point with the slides. Um, but I highly encourage you to check out um, any of the references that I put in those slides. And beyond High Parameter and Teasney, we're going to have to discuss on um, um, what's left to really go over in Flojo, maybe some plate-based analysis. Um, you guys can reach out to us with emails if there's any specific topics you'd like to see where we can start doing just like an open sessions. Um, yeah, so that's it. We, we hope everyone um, from all of the Flowcore at MSK to all of you, we hope you stay safe, um, your family, your loved ones, everybody. And um, thank you for